where it is. And, and uh, you know, I just want to give a shout out to, to Jamie. What a great job he does in putting the band together. Thank you, Steve. You're just knocking it out of the, knocking it out of the park. Wow, Saturday morning. Here's a, nothing I'd rather be doing on a Saturday morning. Well, wow. <laughs> let me just put it this way. If we were doing this in the beach, it would just take a yeah. tour. Yeah. But this is what I'd like to be doing on a Saturday wow. morning. Just worshiping the Lord, connecting with brothers in Christ. You know it's going to be a good day. Amen. Well, uh, this morning we're going to talk about scaling mountains that keep us from victory. Wow. How many of you have scaled some mountains in your day? Amen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sometimes literal mountains. I, I totally don't get that. I really don't get driving in, you know, uh, uh, implements into the side of a very steep mountain uh, or, or a, a sheer and cut. I'm, 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 I'm a sissy when it comes to heights. <laughs> I'm just telling you, I was, I was in a very high place and uh, I, I, I almost slipped and I screamed like a little girl. And uh, my wife said, would you get off that step ladder before you <laughs> I do not like I do not like heights. And, and, and you know the old adage, it's not it's not the fall that I'm afraid of. It's that sudden stop at the end that really troubles me. But uh, but but uh, sometimes we, we go up literal mountains and we hike and uh, uh, and I love the mountains. I have grown up in. I grew up in southwestern Pennsylvania, and and they. I I didn't know this till I was an adult. We don't we don't have mountains in Pennsylvania. We have ridges. <laughs> None of them hit the elevation standard to actually be a mountain. But uh, but uh, in southwestern Pennsylvania, uh, there's a lot of hills and a lot of ridges. And uh, one of my favorite things, it, just in the fall. Going squirrel hunting, I, I just absolutely love hunting in general. There's something about squirrel hunting because it happens when you know it's not freezing cold and it hurts to be there. And and I'll tell you, I climbed this 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 mountain. It was a con confluence up near Somerset, if you know where that is. And we were in a, in a we found a plateau up there and great squirrel hunting. And and I was I like sitting down on a log. And uh, I, I always overpack, that's just how I'm wired. And so I'm sitting on this fallen tree and I get into my backpack and I pull out the, uh, pull out the thermos of coffee. It's, it's, you know, just great, a sandwich. I lay my shotgun across my lap and, this, and, and I'm just enjoying God's nature. It's just absolutely beautiful up on top of this mountain. And I'm sitting there with a sandwich in one hand, cup of coffee in the other, my shotgun across my lap, and this squirrel, well, it, it hops right in front of me. I could have kicked it to death. I mean, it was just that close. And, and I just looked at it. There's nothing you're going to do. I mean, I I, I, could, I wasn't going to put my sandwich down. I was busy. I wasn't going to, you know, I was enjoying that cup of coffee. And I just looked at that squirrel and I said, See you later. Yeah, yeah. And that day I limited it out. It was great. I don't know if it was that squirrel, but scaling mountains. You know, there's there's a, a just one letter difference between two very important words that I want to I want to show you. Overcome is just one letter away from overcome. Isn't it amazing how the simple things, the little nuances, can make a huge difference? Yeah. I want to ask you a question this morning. What position are you in? Are you in that position to where you're almost overcome? You feel like life is just a little bit, a little bit over your head, and you're treading water, and sometimes you know you just feel like you're 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 about tired out. And not going to make it. I, th I think we've all been there. <laughs> but I want to encourage your heart this morning that you just might be one little step away from being an overcomer. Amen. 
Hallelujah. Uh, there is no victory without a fight. Mm. And sometimes we want to live the victorious Christian life, but we want to be absent the war. Wow. It doesn't work like that. It'll never happen like that on this side of eternity. Because in this world, you will have trials and tribulations. Those are the words of Jesus. You know, Jesus, you know sometimes I love the, the Bible promise books that we have, but they don't tell us all the promises. Because here's a promise. In this world, you'll have trial and tribulation. That's a promise. Jesus said it. But be of good cheer, he said, because I've overcome the world. Mm -hmm. And the implication in Jesus' words there is that if he overcame, we can overcome. We're going to talk about that this morning. But let's talk to Jesus first, shall we? Let's bow. Uh, uh, Father, in, as we take the next few moments to look into your word, I pray that your word will look into us. We just, we just open our heart. We open our soul. We open our spirit to you today for you to do a work inside of us. So speak to us. Speak life into us. Speak strength into us this day. And Lord, I'm sure that there are probably those who are here today who are scaling some kind of a mountain. Some kind of a challenge. That's life. Help us to be not overcome, but help us to be overcomers. Give us a victory this day, we pray. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. <laughs> so I've just come back from Honduras. We were in Honduras last week, and it was a missions trip. And, and I've been on a number of missions trips, but this missions trip was, it was just a little bit different. We knew going into it, it was going to be different. I'm 58 years old and overweight. It's my story. And uh, uh, so we knew going into this, uh, this trip, we were going to be visiting some pastors in some very remote locations. Didn't know, 75% of Honduras is on a 25% or greater incline. That's a mountainous country. And so we knew that this was going to involve uh, a canoe uh, up a river, horses, uh, hiking, and uh, uh, donkeys, and, and that kind of thing. But we, I didn't realize, really, the implications of that. And so we took this seven-hour trip from the, the capital city to the river <coughs> bank, and we, we hung out there overnight. And uh, really, my greatest fear in all of this is how are we going to go to the bathroom? I mean, you know, one part of that's very easy, the other part's a little tricky. And uh, then I met the facilities, and all my anxiety was justified. <laughs> but that wasn't really the hardest part of this trip. The hardest part was when we, when we finally went up the river three hours in a canoe. You've got to understand these canoes are four feet deep, 40 feet long, and has a 75 horsepower engine on it. This is not your typical canoe. And they're going up and down this river, and uh, we're, we're doing our mission. So we go three hours up the river, get off, and now we have to hike up a hill. I'm thinking, okay, well, once you get up over the hill, you usually break out into a long flat, and that's what, oh no, oh boy. Um, so you yeah, we went up the hill, and then went down the hill, and it was just like that for hours. In fact, um, I can't see the TV, but uh, yeah, that's on the horse. And a picture just doesn't do it justice. Mm -hmm. But that was, that was the mountain. It was physically demanding. And because it was physically demanding, and as soon as you're starting, and sweating profusely, and, yeah, it was 80, 85 degrees. That was the good part of it. And, um, and you know, it, as you're into this journey, have you ever done that? You get halfway into something, and you say, maybe you should have thought this through. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, uh, so it was, it was physically demanding, which brings on the mental demands, because there's no turning around. We had, we had come three hours up the river, there's no going back. We had driven seven hours to the river, we're ten hours into this, and we still have another three hours of, of hard hiking to get to uh, our destination. 
And so that plays with your mind. Sometimes the mountains we face, they can be physically challenging, they can be mentally and emotionally challenging, and then it drills down into your spirit. <clears throat> becomes spiritually demanding. And in this particular trip, we're going up an incline. I've seen hills like this in western Pennsylvania. They were paved when I was going up with them in a vehicle, we're going up a, a really steep incline, it's rutted, it had just rained, and there was a slurry clay on the, and there were hairpin turns, and to the, to the right is about a thousand feet down. It's not a sheer, but it's really steep, and if we start rolling, we will stop a thousand feet later. <laughs> And we're standing up in the bed of a pickup truck, a mini pickup truck. And, and there's eight of us, and I look around and I say, well, you know, minimum weight here is 200 pounds average. This truck is designed to haul things about 750 or maybe 1,000 pounds. And the center of gravity is really high. I think I've seen this movie, <laughs> and it involves bodies spread across a, a, a large swath of land. And so the whole time we're going up and the driver's just clutching it, he's got it in first gear, and we're, we're going in and out of, of ruts and the and I'm, and I'm like, Jesus, take care of my wife. <laughs> And if this is the day to come home to be with you, I, I just pray that it's painless. <laughs> and so we had a quick meeting and we decided everybody needs to sit down in the bed of this truck at the center of gravity down low. And I, I, I drilled down into a spiritual reality. And that was, you've got to trust God. We are here. We have a long way to go. And there are hills, and not the uphill one wasn't one that scared me. When we got crested and came down the other side. And so our team leader says, Pastor, why don't you sit in the front with the driver? He probably noticed my nonverbal saying, I'm going to melt down. Yes. So I said, Well, if nobody else wants to, I will. So I jump in the front, and the driver looked more scared than me. <laughs> this did not bring comfort to my soul. <laughs> so eventually I find myself in the back of the pickup truck again. And uh, there were two things that, that really occurred to me in those moments. Number one, I didn't need to look over the edge. It wasn't helping me. I wasn't, I mean, there was no comfort there, there was no plan. If something was going to go sideways, it was going to go sideways. Mm -hmm. So, number one, it did not help me to look at the overwhelming circumstances. And number two, I needed to trust Jesus. Mm -hmm. So that's what we were doing. I was praying, committing our trip to the Lord. And I think that Michael and Gabriel put in for hazard pay as they <laughs> escorted us up there. Yeah. Uh, had to dig down and, and, and drill into that thing we call faith and trust in God. So we had to pray, control our imagination, right? How many of you have Sometimes you have an overactive imagination and you're thinking through the worst case scenario. And is that, why is that our default? Maybe it's because everything else that happens is a better deal. Had to engage faith. Let, let, me, let me ask you today, how do we stand strong? How do we meet life's challenges? Not everything's a physical mountain. Sometimes they're, they're, they're uh, metaphoric in nature. A mountain of problems. A mountain of challenges. A mountain of depression. A mountain of anxiety. Have you ever been there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, we have an enemy. 
And Peter talks about the enemy of our soul and his strategy. And Peter says this, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith. Mm -hmm. How about you? Has the enemy ever harassed you? Sometimes he does and we don't recognize it. We project it onto the person that's troubling us or the circumstances. But I'm telling you, there are spiritual dynamics and spiritual dimensions. And there is this, this character called Satan and those forces that are aligned with him. And they have a simple dis job description. Trip you up. Make you fall. How can we, how can we overcome him? Well, that's what I want to talk about for the next couple of minutes. And I want to look at Revelation 12, 11. And let me just set this up. Of course, the book of Revelation is pulling back the curtains into the future. And we're not going to get into the prophetic side of this text today, but suffice it to say there is a battle going on. It involves uh, spirit beings like angels and demons, but it also involves humans. And this is, this is a picture, this is a movie, a clip of history. This is the way it's always been. And in the end, Believers win, can somebody shout glory? We win. In the we end, win. believers win. We win. But there's a fight. There's a struggle. And the question at the end of the day is, are we overcome or are we overcomers? That's the question at the end of the day. And if you've been in this faith thing any amount of time, you've seen the casualties strewn across the field. Amen. There are people that, as I grew up, I grew, I got saved when I was 15 years old. I came to faith in Jesus, really committed my life to Him. When I was 15, I've been serving Him ever since. Sometimes better than others. But thank the Lord, He has kept me. If I were God, I've said this a number of times, if I were God, I would have kept me out of the club a long time ago. <laughs> but thanks be to God, He is great kind and merciful and gracious and forgiving. Amen? So the battle is, has raged and the people of God win. And here's the, here's the summary of the, the, the end of the conflict. Uh, Revelation 12, 11. They over, who's they? The believers. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. How do you become invincible? Mm -hmm. You know, none of us are bulletproof. None of us are super. <coughs> but how do we do that? I think that Revelation 12, 11 gives us a wonderful expression. <coughs> and I'm just going to talk about this for the next couple of minutes. First of all, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. By the power of what Jesus Christ has already done. He did it on Calvary. <coughs> We used to sing that old hymn, there's power in the blood. There's power in the blood. There's wonder-working power. Amen. <coughs> 1927, it was in West Africa, and it was the, it, 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 this became the, the framing out of the way that uh, yellow fever could be, could be managed in West Africa. A blood specimen was taken from a native man named Esibi. He was sick with yellow fever. A vaccine was made from the original strain of virus obtained from this man. In fact, all the vaccine for yellow fever manufactured since 1927 derives from the original strain of virus obtained by that one man carried down to the present day from one laboratory after another through repeated cultures and enormous multiplication. It has offered immunity to yellow fever to millions of people in many countries. Some have come to call it smart blood. 
There's something about the blood of Jesus that has provided untold benefit, not to millions, but to billions of people across time. The blood of the Lamb. It's what regenerates us. It makes us born again. Born anew. It takes our sins away. It gives us a fresh start. They overcame him, the enemy, by the blood of the Lamb. Not by their own efforts. Not by their own ingenuity. Not by their own goodness. Not by their own strength. Because the reality is this. We don't have enough. On a good day, I'm no match for the enemy. But on any day, I can overcome him. Not because I'm Don Immel. Not because I've been serving him for 40 years. That doesn't matter. It's the blood of the Lamb. How powerful are those words? Born again. I love the story of the the man uh, who's a factory worker. And he became born again. And if it's done right, eventually that born again experience works it out in our day-to-day living. Mm -hmm. And he changed his habits because he was changed. It was just a function of what happened on the inside affected what he did on the outside. And so he stopped doing certain things like going off in fits of rage, getting drunk, cursing and telling coarse jokes at work. He changed and his fellow workers saw the change that had happened. And functionally, he wanted to get closer to God. So what he did is he brought his Bible to work with him. That'll mark you. (laughs) During his lunchtime, he would read his Bible, have his lunch. And guys began, you know how guys are. Sometimes we're jerks. (laughs) <laughs> you know, we just like take a shot where we can. And his, and, and his fellow workers at the factory kind of, kind of goading him about all this change and taking bets it won't last. One day he's reading his Bible during lunchtime and one of the, one of the guys who had some church behind him, he said, uh, hey, uh, buddy, uh, tell me, do you really believe that Bible? And he said, yeah, I do. He said, well, do you really believe, because I'd like to get in on this, do you really believe Jesus turned water into wine? The guy sat back and thought for a second, he said, whether or not Jesus turned water into wine when he lived in Palestine, I, I can't say. But I do know that in my very own house and home, he has turned beer into furniture. <laughs> Jesus, will, Jesus will change your life. Thank you, man. He changes our experience and our expression. Because of the blood of the Lamb, because of what happened on Calvary, He puts new men inside of us. Yes. Amen. And the good news is we are renewed daily. Yes. The good news is we come to the cross every day. And if we confess our sins, what happens? He's faithful. Yes. And He's just. And He forgives us of all of our sins. And He cleanses us from all unrighteousness. The blood of the Lamb. It has turned alcoholics sober. It has set free drug addicts. It has restored peace to the disturbed. It has saved marriages. The blood of the Lamb is transformation. It saves. It delivers. It heals. The blood of the Lamb gives eternal life and brings to us life abundantly. It appeases God's wrath and eases the sinner's conscience. The work that Christ did on the cross And rising from the dead empowers us internally to meet demands. The fight that Satan brings to our soil. Temptation. Have you ever experienced it? Today? Discouragement. Has it ever come to visit you? Distractedness. If Satan can't tempt you out of the kingdom, he'll distract you out of it. 
Get your life heading in different directions that God didn't want it to go. Yes. The work that Christ did on the cross, it makes us invincible. Yes. Not because we're strong in ourselves, but because we're strong in Him. Amen. Without Him, I can do nothing. Yes. But with Him, all things are possible. Yes. Yep. Jesus is the blueprint for overcoming. We've already quoted it out of John 16, 33. In this world you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Why? I've overcome the world. Amen. Matthew 28, 18. Uh, uh, all authority is given unto me. Jesus says, go therefore and win the world. Make disciples of all nations. How can we do it? Well, because we get a book on witnessing. That's how we can. No, no, no. Those are helps. <clears throat> and thank God for them. But we overcome by the blood of the Lamb. Yes. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb. And secondly, and finally, we overcome by the word of our testimony. This is the power of a life well lived. Oh, friends, when we live for Jesus, we're changing the world. Mm -hmm. Whether we know it or not, my goodness. I love the old hymn that says, He breaks the power of cares and sin. Mm -hmm. He sets the prisoner free. Mm -hmm. His blood is made the foulest clean. His blood avails <coughs> for me. I'm glad that Jesus is a chain breaker. Mm -hmm. There are times where our genetics predispose us. There are times that the environment that we grew up in predisposes us. I grew up in a home that was abusive. I came to learn that my father grew up in a home that was abusive. I would dare say that if we studied our family tree, we would find that there's been a long line of abuse. Mm. I'll tell you, when I, when I was engaged in getting ready to be married, I was afraid to have children. Mm. I was afraid. <clears throat> because of some of the hell that I went through as a kid, I did not want to put anyone else through that. But the blood of the Lamb came into our family in 1975, and the chain of abuse was broken. Amen. 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 It's what He does. There's a functional outcome. Yeah. If you want to climb mountains, you have, you have to get in shape. Yes. Right? Yeah. I am in shape. Round is a shape. <laughs> <laughs> but if you really want to get serious and, and, and climb mountains, I, 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 about uh, 10 years ago, I was 17 years ago, 13 years ago, uh, uh, we, uh, we decided to do a bicycle trip from Pittsburgh to Washington, D.C. Wow. And we did it on the rails to trails kind of a thing. And, and it was great because I lost 50 pounds. I found it again. But I lost it. And, and um, uh, all winter long, you know, I was at the gym. I was on a stationary bicycle. I was playing racquetball twice a week. And I, I was just in really great shape. Uh, and, and, and it felt good. And, and prayerfully, I'm going to get back to that. You know, it's amazing how quickly I found that you can lose your edge. So we were biking 60, on average, 60 to 70 miles a day. And on a trail, that's different than a road trip. Mm -hmm. It's different than Amosite. It takes a little more leg to do that. And um, anyway, uh, we decided after we got back, we did this thing. We got back and we wanted to do a centennial day. We wanted to do a 100-mile day. And we were in great shape now. We had just five days in a row. 
We're biking 60 to 70 miles a day, and we were doing good. So we put it for two weeks away, but none of us rode between those times. At 75 miles, we quit. Why are we doing this? Just to say we can? Ah, let's go get a sandwich. So it's amazing how quickly you can lose your physical edge. You know something, folks? You can lose your spiritual edge. The way we do life has a shape to it, a fitness. The more we walk in the spirit, the better spiritual shape we'll be in. Mm -hmm. Life's going to bring mountains to challenge us. It's going to be hardships. Shift in your job or in your job market. There's going to be trials. You lose someone you love or maybe you have physical challenges. Temptations that we face. Yes. What will you do <laughs> at the party when somebody comes up and hands you a beer and says, here, have one. What will you do when you're surfing and there's nobody around and you come across a channel that has eye candy? You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you do when a woman makes an overture or you just feel that chemistry? How will you respond? You'll need to be in spiritual condition long before the temptation comes to you. Are you in shape? Paul said in Galatians 5.16, walk in the spirit and you won't fulfill the lusts of the flesh. That's how we get in spiritual shape. You can overcome the enemy by the word of your testimony. Uh, real quick, George Heisey. He was, a, he was a, a parent of our youth when I was a youth pastor many, many moons ago. George had a, a kind of a birth defect in his one arm was much shorter than the other. But he was able to function just fine. He worked in a factory and his machine. Uh, um, he would come in, he would tell me, I go to work and they will have a centerfold posted behind my machine where it's difficult for me to get back there because of where it's at in my arm. But every time they pull one up, I just tear it down and throw it in the garbage and keep working. He, oh, he's an overcomer. Mm. He's overcoming by the blood of the Lamb and the word of his testimony. Amen. <clears throat> Morris Chapman, a wonderful uh, worship leader. I, I had him at our church uh, a number of years ago and we were at a restaurant and the, the, the waitress was just bizarre that night. I don't know if she had not taken her meds or if she had taken too many. But she was just off the charts this bizarre. And I'm thinking, I'm so embarrassed. I have this guest that I hold in high esteem. And do you, does anyone ever struggle with anger? Raise your hand if you ever get uh, yeah. Okay, somebody's raised two hands. I really that's, yeah, that's making up for somebody who didn't admit it. But anyway, yeah, yeah. So uh, my 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 temperament, I'm starting to boil. I'm at a simmer, and it's getting ready to boil. And I'm thinking, I need to go tell the manager that I am just so embarrassed by this. And we're getting ready, and they bring us the check, and there's that line for a tip. Oh, I've got a tip. And Morris says to me, I got this. <laughs> no, you're my guest. I got this. It's going to be low. <laughs> Morris, Morris reaches into his wallet and pulls out a 20. This is for a $20 check. He said, that sister needs blessed. Oh, <laughs> 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 you know, sometimes... <laughs> We learn in humility. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. we've gotten here embarrassed ourselves to death. Right mm -hmm. And my brother Morris showed me grace and mercy and generosity that day. And he took my spiritual life to a different level. Mm -hmm. He overcame. Yes. 
You know, this is a fine example. I just want to read it to you. It's better written. No greater example of forgiveness than <coughs> this one incredible story came out of Tulsa, Oklahoma. The guy's name's Tom McGee, a young man who went out for a night of party. Got drunk, ran head on into a car driven by a young man by the name of Ted Morris. He killed Ted Morris instantly while driving under the influence. This wasn't the first time he'd been arrested for drunk driving. So Tom McGee was put on trial for manslaughter, found guilty, sentenced to several years in prison. But the prison was crowded. Prisoners were being given early paroles. So Tom McGee actually spent only a few months in prison before being released on parole. But he evidently didn't learn his lesson, for it wasn't long. He was arrested again for drunk driving, so his parole was revoked. And he was sent back to complete his prison sentence. Jack Morris, his victim's father, visited Tom McGee in prison. After visiting several times, he started taking cookies that his wife Elizabeth had baked. They became friends. Finally, Tom McGee was released from prison. He had no place to go. So Jack and Elizabeth Morris invited him into their home. Gave him a place to stay. He provided a means by which he could get an education. Helped him find a job. The man who killed their son. <laughs> the members of the Church of Christ in Tulsa, so they took him to church with them. Wow. When Tom McGee accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. Amen. He was baptized. Just recently, the article said the news has come out that Jack and Elizabeth formally adopted Tom McGee, wow. made him their son. When Jack and Elizabeth Morris die, Tom McGee will inherit whatever they've accumulated in life. They overcame. Oh, okay. you face? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Worship team, would you come back? Mm -hmm. What are you facing? What mountain are you facing? <laughs> Addiction is usually nurtured in the soil of secrecy. It's how it flourishes. The temptations that we face, sometimes they are overwhelming tax us to and beyond our limits. I want you to know that you can overcome. The question is, are you overcome or an overcomer? And we can make that transition any day of the week by surrendering it to Jesus. They overcame the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony by what Jesus did on the cross and how they walked it out you can be an overcomer you can be stronger when you leave this place than when you enter it today how do we do that it always starts with a decision and then it continues with follow through but it always starts with a decision and I know that, you know, uh, uh, there are some people who just naturally push back to, like, New Year's resolutions. And someone once said that more change is affected by people who make resolutions than those who don't. Mm -hmm. So I don't put it down. I don't put a lot of, <laughs> you know, a lot of credit to it either. But when we bring something to Jesus, that's a whole new level. It, it, it goes from a wish list to a prayer list. It goes from a good intention to a spirit-driven follow-through. And in just a moment, we're going to worship, we're going to seek the Lord. And I, I want to ask you, what mountain are you scaling? What hill are you climbing? 
I know how it is with people. I'm one of them. There are times where you feel like your knuckles are dragging on the ground. You're just out of gas. God excels at helping people who are out of gas. He just does. When we turn to the end of the book, there's a great victory after this substantial battle. And the people of God win. How do they win? How do they win? Not on the basis of self-determination. Not on the basis of self-help books. They overcome the devil by the blood of the Lamb. By the word of their testimony. By what Jesus did and how they walked it out. Let's pray. So God, speak to our hearts today. There may be folks here who really haven't even taken the first step. There may be people here today who are just, they feel out of gas. Emotionally, spiritually, mentally. And there are still mountains to climb. I pray that you'll speak to our heart. Speak faith into our life today. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Let me challenge you today, man. If you're here today and you say, you know, this is the day I need to commit my life to Jesus Christ. I need something more than what I've got. And I want to invite God into my life. I want to believe in Jesus and move forward. If that's you today, would you slip your hand up and right back down again? I want to commit my life to God today. I want to invite God into my life. Yes, sir. are there others? Here's my hand. Include me, yes, sir. Yes. Are there any others? Include me, yes, sir. Yes, sir. We'll pray with you. Are there others? You're not alone. We already know four or five that have raised their hand. You don't have to feel alone today. You're in good company. Yes. By the way, this isn't a sign of weakness. This is a sign of intense strength. Is there anyone else? Pastor, I'm going to pray that prayer too. Anyone else? And with your head still bowed and your eyes still closed, are there any that are struggling? I don't need to know the details. God knows. But you're facing a mountain and it's just overwhelming. You need help. You need prayer. You need God's help in your life. Is that you? Yes. Yeah. God bless you. Yeah. God bless you. God knows it. God knows it. You're not alone. You might have been in this fight for a year or 40 years. Time isn't the, 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 the defining characteristic as being human. So here's what we're going to do. Would you stand with me? And if you raised your hand for either of those two things, you're going to invite God to come into your life today. You're going to ask for prayer to press through and climb the mountain in front of you. Would you please come to the front and let us pray with you, pray for you. We're going to seek God. I need God's help. I'm coming forward. Come and worship team. Would you lead us? God bless you guys. God bless you, man of God. You're not alone. You are not alone. We're not going to abandon you. We're standing with you. Walking around this world, I thought by now they fall. But you never failed me. Oh, to come and help us pray for these who have come up this morning and then in a couple of moments we're going to ask just men who love the Lord to come and join us too. We're going to pray with our friends. We're going to help them up the mountain. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.
If you raised your hand to ask the Lord into your life today, would you pray this prayer with me? And I'm going to ask all the guys so that we're not standing alone. Pray this prayer with me. Dear Lord, I need you. And I invite you to come into my heart. Come into my life. Forgive me, please, for the times I've failed. Forgive me, please, for the sins I've done. With your help, God, I'm going to walk with you. With your help, God, I'm going to live for you from this moment on. Please help me, God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.